Hey, thank you very much. Quick show of hands, who recognizes that machine? Okay, <laughs> there's a few, good. What that is is an RS6000, and that was underneath my desk in 1990. And uh, we just finished, I was really excited when it arrived because it was the first compiler I'd worked on at IBM. And this is what we were using to program effectively what became the PowerPC. The PowerPC um, came out in October 1st, 1991. And I was in the, sitting in the lab in Austin when the very first PowerPC came out. And I was monkey at the keyboard for my team back in Toronto. I had to be down in the lab because there's only three of them there that were working at the time. And we were trying to tune up the compilers. And then a couple months later, Power 2 came out. So I've been involved with the power architectures for a long time. But um, it still is my favorite architecture, an ISA. And then when I was at Freescale, as you says, we um, were working on that and moving it up to 64 bits too. And these sorts of things get interesting, especially because we started using that as going to Linux. And that was the start of my working with open source. And so like Paul McCarris was my mentor when I, we went to Ottawa Linux Symposium to make sure I didn't make a mess for his architecture, thank you very much, as I was starting to work with the Linux community. And Linux has been a, obviously a large theme underneath my career. And eventually started working with the Linux Foundation too. So today Zephyr supports these six architectures. Zephyr supports these six architectures today. Um, there's a couple of variants of ARM. There's um, some experimental R and some experimental A cores, but it's mostly M cores. And then for the RISC V, there's 32 and 64 bit cores in there. And Intel has the x86 64 in it. And I'm looking forward to seeing that be my slide going forward, okay? So, what Zephyr is, though, um, who's been familiar with Zephyr? Hand show. Oh, good. Fresh audience. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, what Zephyr is, is it's an open source real-time operating system. We put it together um, because we had a very, very fragmented space down in the low end of the ecosystem. And Linux really doesn't get much smaller than about 2 meg, and that's if you push it to 2 meg. 3 meg was what I was been told is most comfortable for the tinification group. And we wanted to make sure that we could actually secure the endpoints, and we could use it for safety-critical applications. So when we started the project off, these were end goals. And we were basically working to make sure we had a vibrant community. So we took a lot of the lessons from Linux. So embedded Linux developers are generally pretty comfortable because the code was pretty much um, refactored by Linux developers originally. It is cross-architecture, as you can see. It's also vendor neutral. The same way the Linux kernel is vendor neutral, um, we have governance around Zephyr. And it's a meritocrat meritocratic, it's working with a DCO, like Linux does, and it's permissively licensed, which makes it a little bit more friendly for some embedded people. It's also very modular, you're statically compiling everything in. It's kconfig, so again, Linux kernel developers um, have been pretty happy there. And we are working to get a product, well, we've just gotten a product ready now with the RLTS, which is, again, Linux concept, a long-term stable, and we have been doing security updates for it. And we're now starting to get it ready for um, safety certifications and starting to work on transforming the code and figuring out how we can go after um, 61508 and other certifications. So it's a pretty full and complete architecture. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but as you can see, there's a pretty good stack. We actually probably have one of the best Bluetooth, low energy stacks out there. In fact, the Bluetooth SIG uses us as a proving point for the new specs these days. There's also um, open thread and a variety of accelerators for the crypto. The community actually has been growing pretty quickly. The project actually started in, um, we launched it February 2016, and, and there have been 80 con commits into that GitHub repo at the time. There's now f over 500 participants in there. There's um, over 34,000 commits and we've probably got about 200 boards sitting in the repo. And the company, when this, the pie chart when we first started was effectively 
three companies, uh, Intel, Wind River, and Tieto, which was a contractor. And we've been working very diligently to make sure we actually start to diversify it. And as you can see now, in the last year, we're pretty diversified in terms of who's committing. So as user supported architectures today, but we also have POSIX. And this has got added in uh, for the LTS so that we would have that as a foundation for people who want to work with systems and move systems into it. Here's a quick sampling of the boards we've got. There's over 200 right now, and it's a lot of, there's already some uh, FPGA boards in there, and there's also QME for most of the architectures available. Um, and then last week, there was a really nice note from Mikey that said, <laughs> we've got something, come have a look at it. And I was delighted to see that. Anton and I had chatted a little bit about that as a possibility uh, last August. And um, I was sort of hoping my, you know, hoping, hoping my breath would all come in. And it is there. And so the next thing we see, um, Kumar chimes in, excellent. He wants to hack on PowerPC again. Thank you very much. Um, Kumar Gala actually was on my team when I was at Freescale, and he was one of the first um, contributors up to the Linux kernel. So there's a lot of fans that really liked working on power and are looking for opportunities, especially in the embedded space, to be back on it. Um, to give you a bit of a flavor, as I said, the embedded RTOS space is a very diversified. Um, there's a lot of options down there with varying degrees of strengths and weaknesses. Um, for Zephyr last year, we had over 10,000 commits. To get, put that in perspective, it's about one commit per hour um, on average. And uh, to put it relative to the Linux kernel, the Linux kernel is about nine commits per, per hour based on Greg's calculation. So we're about a tenth of the velocity at this point in time of the kernel. Oops. Hello. One of the things we do, I keep an eye on every month is every month I go into GitHub. And everything except NetX is actually a GitHub repo. So I can go look at the insights. And as you could tell from my initial discussions of what I was doing back at IBM, I've done a lot of work on benchmarking. And I like the fact quite, that GitHub is neutral. It doesn't have a bias. And it's trying to measure the same things across all these projects. So if I go in every month at a certain point in time to do a, a, a scan, I can kind of see what's happening. And certainly for the last year, we've pretty much been number one or number two in terms of the commits each month, mm -hmm. and our contributor count and our total counts have been going up. In fact, they've been going up um, faster than the industry has, the rest of our, the ecosystem out there. And we actually have probably now the most contributors to any of these RTOSs as of this last month. We crossed that line that Embed had. And then obviously, we've seen people use it. When we look in, we've seen, in a two-week period, almost uh, 9,800 people um, are cloning it, unique people, and then there's 12,000 clones going down. So people are downloading it and doing things with it. Now, of course, since it's embedded, since it's open source, the question is, what are they doing with it? And let's see if we can do some detective work to figure that out. Mostly, it's talking to developers to figure out what's happening. But we do have a vibrant community. There's over 1,000 on Slack. And it's a pretty friendly community. Um, and we've got a pretty active, you know, we tend to work on Twitter mostly for letting people know what's going on. We've got mail lists as well. And there's good discussion there, as you saw from Mikey's email. But we actually have products now that we found. Again, detective work, there's a lot more out there. But these are the ones that are publicly announced that they're using Zephyr. So I can show their images here. We're seeing from things in tracking devices. Um, the Hero Core box is, gets welded onto the side of a garbage truck, and every time the truck tilts, it sends a signal saying where it's located, so that you can make sure that landfill, you know, basically that garbage trucks are dumping in landfills as opposed to tipping on the side. Um, AnyCare is ear tags for reindeer, which, for tracking, which is much better than some of these big tracking collars. And so we're seeing really interesting applications emerge in the ecosystem right now with Zephyr. I'm looking forward to seeing more in the next year. Now, I did say that we followed the path from um, Linux of using a long-term support. And I want to just give you a little bit of a flavor for what's going on there. 
When we started the project, this was a diagram. It really has not changed. We had this vision that if we wanted to go after um, certifications, we needed to be able to slow the pace down, but we didn't want to throttle development with the community because we needed both. So we've got a development repo that's now um, working on the 2.1 release, and we also have a, um, a long-term support stable, which is the 14 point, it's 1.14. And we just put out 1.1, we'll be putting it, working on the next update to that. And then a subset of the long-term stable is what we're calling auditable. And that's what we're working on hardening for the safety world. Um, long-term support, like the Linux kernel, is product-focused, and it's current with security updates. And it's compiled with new hardware, but it's not features. We're not, all the features are going up in development, and it's not the cutting edge for us. This is what we're recommending people use for products the same way people st stabilize on an LTS for um, things like Android or um, their you know, basic product lines or distros. They sort of go with the LTSs because they know they'll have the updates going on. And we put out 1.14 in April, and at the start of this month, we just put out the 1.14.1. And as you can see, we put a CVE in there that one of the researchers had found, so we've updated it. And we also had gotten two Bluetooth qualifications in this period. We got uh, the qualifications logged for host to mesh on behalf of Zephyr itself, which helps people who are wanting to do, actually build products on top of that not have to go through that as well. And so Auditable is a stable branch of the LTS. It's just a subset. And we're working with it for the certification. Um, its codes are going to be kept in sync. And we have a safety and security committee working with it. The security committee uh, meets bi-weekly. It was established pretty early on in the project. And we actually are a CNA. We're one of the few open source projects that are. So we can monitor our, and work with any vulnerabilities that are coming in directly and um, you know, make judgment calls appropriate for the code community. The security group um, has a PCERT team that's working actively. And we've actually been looking at another LF project, which is the best practices badge for open source projects, and we've been following that. And we've been using that to basically bootstrap our best practices throughout the project. It took about three years, but we're finally gold. I think we're in one of the three golds, which we're pretty proud of. And then we're doing a lot of work with increasing the automation in our CI loops to prevent regressions, and actually starting to look at um, the MISRA stuff, the MISRA um, specifications for slowly transforming the code base and making sure we get that automatically there so we can go after the safety certifications. As I say, there's very few that actually have an ability to report CV and act work, work with the CVE system. Um, Minute gets it through Apache. The Apache organization does that. Huawei has it. AliOS has it. But these other RTOSs do not. Um, and that's one of the things that uh, we think we want to make sure that the endpoints are secured so that we don't have the garbage and we have a secure communication paths as well. Now, as we're going on um, towards Audible, with this just this year, we've, now that we have the LTS out, we actually established the safety committee to start doing this transformation. The governing board of the project said 61508 is our target, so that's where we're going to. And um, we're working on getting coding practices agreed to within the project and working on getting it avoiding regressions and going forward with covarity scans. We're also using commercial tooling, not just open source right now, because um, we want to make sure we get it hardened to the level that's out there in other places. And there doesn't seem to be good open source options yet. The two OSs that have paths right now that are explicit public, explicitly public about going after security are free RTOS, which if you use it, it goes to a proprietary, the safer RTOS. And for us, we're saying our LTS will go to auditable, and that's the path. Um, these are actually the coding standards we're going to be using. And there's the safety standard specifically. We'd like to, get, we'd like to be targeting SIL 3 eventually to SIL 4. And that's a good base point for a lot of the other medical as well as automotive standards. And I said it was a subset. This is, these are the... Um, I guess I should have used the pointer. Anyhow, you can sort of see the once colored in blue are what we're doing is initial scope. And then what we'll be doing beyond that is extending out 
module by module and hardening each of these modules as we go along. So we're starting with a restricted scope of what's key for certain members and then working our way out. So we're not trying to boil the ocean at once. We're trying to go in a successive and make it real stage. Hello. And we've got a large number of use cases out there where Zephyr is engaging in. And you know, we're starting the simple ones and we're heading towards the more complex over time. So again, we're working our way step by step and learning as we go. So our roadmap has us basically looking towards by the next LTS, we should be certified. Um, and that's gonna be 2021. That's where we're targeting right now. And this next year, it's gonna be focusing on the code quality and getting all the infrastructure in place to prevent regressions, as well as having that code base prep for everything. So just wanted to close for you guys with a little bit of a look forward. And um, I've been talking about safety critical systems, and I don't know how much you guys have got background in it. I've been learning quite heavily up myself over the last few years, but we're seeing embedded um, being used in a lot of places that do become safety critical. Medical implants, obviously, are obviously one. Um, as are, you know, sensors in cars, things like that. And things where, you know, if it goes wrong and we haven't figured it out properly, it could hurt someone. And this is why we're sort of having an element of focus on it because we want, we see that this is the way the industry is going. Up till now, it's all been um, build your own, work with another, you know, proprietary RTOS. Uh, and we see the need of innovation and change happening so fast that we want to be able to have these open source options there. So with safety critical systems, um, first thing is importance of the process engineering and management, and then the appropriate tools and the environments are there as well as you understand really what's on your system. That's straight from Wikipedia, I'll let you read it yourself. <laughs> but what it boils down to is pedigree and, pro pedigree and provenance. You have to have a complete understanding of the creation, custody, and interaction of all the elements in your system in order to make the assessment that it's safe. Um, and then once you have that, you also need to be using validated tools and processes to create the elements that make up the system. And you have to be able to track all that. And we all know that PowerPC has a great set of validated tools and processes around it. It's got 20 odd years of it. And it, you know, we've, I think there was, it's been to Mars, it's been to various many places around the world, and it's been in a lot of very mission critical spaces. So the tooling and the infrastructure, the ecosystem is there. With MicroWatt showing up now, we actually have the ability to take and actually be very explicit about the hardware without an NDA. This is gonna let the safety community um, be able to pull a full system together that has the software and the hardware explicitly be able to analyze all the interfaces to actually create an accurate software bill of materials as well as the interactions to make the analysis whether something is safe or not. And that has been a bit of a missing piece from the open source perspective in the sense that a lot of the manufacturers do not want to release their error codes and uh, certain information. So doing proper safety analysis requires an NDA, which doesn't work well in an open source ecosystem. Zephyr, as you can see, is going in this direction as well. And the two of them together seem like they might be satisfying the prerequisites. We've got a rich ecosystem of validated tools. There's all the transparency in the open hardware. There's the transparency of open source software. And so to me, anyhow, at least it seems a really exciting basis for the next generation of safety critical systems and embedded and chances for some of, you know, people to be using power again in the embedded space. Thank you.